New reporting in ProPublica has provided the fullest accounting yet of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas's undisclosed gifts, courtesy of his wealthy benefactors. The newly revealed perks include at least 38 destination vacations, 26 private jet flights, and a dozen VIP passes to professional and college sporting events, two stays at luxury resorts in Florida and Jamaica, and one standing invitation to an exclusive golf club overlooking the Atlantic coast. NBC News reached out to Justice Thomas for comment on the report, but didn't hear back. And in a new piece for Slate, my next guest suggests that those gifts point to the creation of a cult of personality that was engineered from the top down. She writes, quote, what has been allowed to happen with some of the justices at the Supreme Court is far more corrupt than mere pay to play. It's pay to create a myth of holy judicial infallibility, a lie that ultimately, ultimately benefits both the payers and the paid. Joining me now is the author of that article, Dahlia Lithwick, Slate senior editor, MSNBC contributor, and New York Times bestselling author of Lady Justice. Dahlia, welcome back to the show. You make the point in, in your article that uh, Justice Thomas's rich friends are really out to make him a national cultural icon. The question is why? Well, I think in some part in response to what happened around the notorious RBG, right, who does become a national, if not international, cultural rock star in a move that is really ground up, you know, that is driven by young women law students who are reading her dissent in Shelby County, right? We get movies, we get an entire kind of cult of personality around RBG that in some sense actually probably hurt the country, might have been slightly responsible for her failure to step down when she should have, and probably responsible for everyone's collective sense that we don't need to do anything about the court because RBG is handling it. But I think in response to that, there was a kind of effort to sock puppet that up, to make it happen for Clarence Thomas, not from the ground up, not because fans were, you know, writing songs to him and making movies, but just because his billionaire friends were paying to have portraits put up, have movies made, have books done. And it really does look as though this effort to counter the sort of hagiography around RBG wasn't something that happened because Americans are in love with Clarence Thomas. It's that very, very wealthy people wanted Clarence Thomas to be a cult figure. Mm -hmm. And in some sense, the piece that Mark Stern and I wrote this week suggests that it also contributed to the feeling that Justices Alito and Thomas have evinced that they're bulletproof, that they're so perfect, they're so godlike, uh, that they don't need to be regulated at all. Huh. And that gets to a great segue to my next question, because yesterday, um, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Congressman Jerry Nadler, Raskin, Johnson, Ted Lieu, they wrote to the DOJ requesting that the attorney general open an investigation into Clarence Thomas and his potential violation of the Ethics of Government, uh, Ethics of Government Act of 1978. But, Dahlia, wouldn't this run afoul of separation of powers? Well, this is precisely the problem we've been litigating all year at the Supreme Court, is that even Chief Justice John Roberts has batted away any conversation about regulating the justices' ethical uh, conduct by saying, hey, 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 separation of powers, Congress can't touch us. And you may recall a few short weeks ago, the Wall Street Journal featured a kind of coffee-out-your-nose funny interview, quote-unquote, with Justice Alito, in which he made the point that Congress has absolutely no role to play in regulating the court. I'll say that folks were very quick to point out that Justice Alito's own seat on the court was created by an act of Congress in 1837. In other words, his, his is an extra seat uh, that was added not by the Constitution, but by Congress. And so it's very, very clear. And I think that Justice Kagan has the better of this debate. She made this point a few weeks ago at the Ninth Circuit. It's very clear that Congress has a longstanding role in regulating judicial pay the size of the court, the jurisdiction of the court, and the notion that Congress cannot do anything but sort of lie there supine as the court rolls over the country is just a myth. And maybe the last thing I would say about this is one of the two lawyers who interviewed Justice Alito in that Wall Street Journal piece where Alito said, nobody can touch us 
quote, no provision in the Constitution gives Congress the authority to regulate the court, period, quote. One of the lawyers in that case in that, uh, who, who, sorry, wrote that interview with him, literally represents folks in a major tax case before the court. Oh. So it's such an insular little bubble of the same defenders, the same attorneys, the same journalists, saying over mm -hmm. and over and over again, we're not compromised, the magic. Uh, you, you called it, that, that Wall Street Journal piece, coffee out the nose funny. Unintentionally funny um, is <laughs> is is what you what you really meant, Dahlia Lithwick. Thank you as always for coming to the Saturday show and sharing your your knowledge and wisdom.